Okay, you already know this, but the Volvo XC90 is the coolest and sexiest large SUV money can buy. Now, you might disagree with that, but that's totally okay for you to be wrong. But the thing is, things that are sexy and cool in their prime have a habit of degrading with age. For example, Johnny Depp and Steven Seagal. Plus, used Volvos have a bit of a, let's say, a turbulent relationship with reliability. So the big question is, should you ever seriously consider buying one of these? Let's find out. Now guys, in this video, we're gonna be focusing on the second generation XC90 that first graced us with its amazing good looks from 2015, and it's actually still a current model. And if you go hunting through the classifieds here in Australia, you're gonna be presented with over 20 possible variants of the XC90, spanning three iterations. However, this abundance of models is not as convoluted as it may initially seem. First of all, know your generations. See, the initial XC90 ran for about four years. The mid-cycle update was relatively subtle overall, and the third and current range has been the most heavily revised. And then we come to the specific models. As you can see, the first two generations were offered in primarily three models, with all powered by various two-litre turbocharged four-cylinder engines that each send power to all four wheels via an eight-speed automatic gearbox. And look, I should mention this T8 with its turbo and supercharger and electric motor, the whole hybrid setup. It is very impressive, but it is very, very complex. And with complexity often comes confusion. And we'll get into why confusion can be a reliability nightmare later in the video. Now, remember how I mentioned that the more recent iteration has been heavily revised? Well, while Volvo retained two-litre engines, they dropped the previous T petrol and D diesel options for B mild hybrid engines, while the flagship plug-in hybrid was renamed. And as well as the various models, you'll also have, like generally speaking, like three different trim levels. And what is available will vary on the year, generation, and the specific model. But what these feature and offer will obviously vary across the range too. Plus you have all like the uh, optional packages like the Polestar Performance Package fitted to this car. Now the chances are if you want to buy something like this, you're going to have to pay for it. And unless you've got thousands of dollars hidden under your mattress, you're probably going to have to finance it. And that's where Driver comes in. With Driver, there's no need to talk to a complete stranger for hours about your personal finance. You can just apply easily online. You can choose the finance package that best suits your needs. There are no hidden fees and you can get pre-approval in just minutes. Plus, finance your next car via that driver link down there and you're going to get 150 bucks worth of free fuel. Awesome. And you know what else is awesome? Being able to see where you're going when it rains. And that brings in WiperTech. Look guys, WiperTech, they're honestly some of the best wipers we've ever used. They're easy to order online. They're delivered straight to your door. They're easy to fit. As I said, they do a great job. And if you order from that link down there, you're going to get 15% off and free express shipping. And now that we've paid a few of our bills, let's talk about the looks of this stunning thing. As you may have picked up, I'm a huge fan of this vehicle. You know a design's good when it's timeless. This thing's pushing like 10 years old, which means the actual overall design was probably done maybe 12 to 15 years ago, and it still looks fantastic. Even the first iterations of these, they still look really current. And I argue that this in another 10 or 15 years is still gonna look bloody good. And another sign of excellent design is these, even in their early base spec with the smaller wheels and in some of the, I don't know, not so attractive colors, it still looks right. Let alone this color with the optional wheels and the Polestar package, gorgeous. If you don't agree, you're wrong. However, like many, let's say aesthetically pleasing creatures, it might look fabulous on the outside, but like some of my exes, inside there are some issues going on. We'll cover them soon. Now, obviously the big question when it comes to the exterior is what is the TBTL factor or the turn back to look factor? It's when you walk away from a car and turn back to look. I give this easily a 9.1. Okay, inside it's more utterly beautiful Scandinavian design in here. I personally love like anything of Scandinavian design and this represents everything I love. Pretty much everything you touch as well, it feels premium, like the leather on the steering wheel feels nice. This all feels really, really nice. Good amounts of carpet down here. This could be scratchy plastic, but instead they've used carpet. Even like the carbon fiber trim on this, I'm pretty sure it's actual carbon fiber. I don't think it's fake. If that's fake carbon fiber, that's the best fake carbon fiber I've ever seen. But notice how I said nearly everything feels premium because there are just a few little things that don't, and this is being super picky. The volume control, like the actual knob itself, there's like no resistance to it, so it just feels a bit cheap. Some of this black gloss plastic, again, this isn't Volvo's fault. This is every manufacturer with bloody gloss black plastic. It scratches really easily, and it just, the buttons here, they just, even this, the drive mode button just feels a little on the cheap side. But then like the leather on the seats, it still feels super supple and premium. Actually, wear and tear in general in this car, this is used daily 
and it's quite good. It's funny, like some of the stitching here is getting a little bit old. Some of the textures are getting a little bit smooth, but door cards feel good. I feel like with a really, really good detail, this would just be completely revived but you can tell it's getting on a little bit in age. Now, as far as ergonomics go, these seats are so comfortable. There's so much adjustability in here as well. And honestly, it is a it's a beautiful place to be. And then as far as practicality up front, you've got a spot perfectly sized for your minimalistic re-driven water bottle here. Excellent size door bins. Spot for life's filth just down there. A cute little like felt lined cubby hole down here. I'm not sure what you'd put in there, but something that's kind of fragile because it'll get polished while it's down there. Underneath this cool roller trapdoor, you've got two cup holders there, spot perfectly sized for your keys here. Another spot perfectly sized for your keys. There. And they, oh, hang on, wait. Maybe not perfectly sized. No, not perfectly sized. Close enough. Then, under here you've got more storage space here with your auxiliary inputs and USB ports and stuff. You're thinking, well, there's no glove box, there's no handle. There is, it's a button. Decent sized glove box there for a lifetime supply of straws, apparently. And that's it for practicality up front. But one thing that's really annoying, there's nowhere specifically for your phone. Like, you can't really put it here, it just slides around everywhere. If you're using your cup holders, you can't put it down there. You obviously can put it in the center console or maybe hide it down here, but yeah, it'd just be nice if there was like an allocated spot for your phone. Now in the back seat, I'm exactly 7.2 iced Volvo packets tall. This is in my driving position, and if this thing wasn't on the back of it, I'd have a great amount of space. Good amount of knee room, good amount of foot room, really comfortable. These are obviously for the kids, they store a whole bunch of stuff, but without these, super comfortable back here. Also, seat comfort, so good. These seats are ultra comfortable, wear and tear in here quite good as well. Like Again, this thing gets a hell of a workout during the week and seats feel nice and supple, all the textures are good, door cards are good. For a car that gets a proper workout, really good wear and tear back here. Also, the rear seats can slide and also recline back and forth to get even more comfortable. Also, this one's fitted with the optional kids booster seat. How good's that? Now, as far as practicality in the second row, really good. First of all, vents, which are fantastic. Spots for life's filth just here. Good sized door bins, and they're also easy to get to even if you have legs. There are map pockets or nets on the backs of the seats. Also, the backs of the seats are like a kind of a hard plastic, so wear and tear should be good there. You've got your own power outlet. Oh, obviously, as you can see, this car has the option of the iPad holders on the back as well, which are also charged. There's like USB charging ports here. Excellent. More vents here with aircon controls here, pull down armrest and two cup holders which kind of come out like a little transformer which is really cool. And that's it for practicality in the second row. Now before we get into the third row, actually getting in isn't too bad. Just pull that lever forward, everything slides forward and straight in. Now in the third row, look, Volvo claim, it's a bit like being on a roller coaster for kids, Volvo claim that you shouldn't be more than about 170 centimetres tall to fit back here. I'm 188 and this, it's not too bad. I'm not supposed to be back here according to Volvo. But like, it's actually quite comfortable because the actual seat part is raised up a little bit. Yeah, for kids, this would be pretty comfy. Wear and tear back here for this car, obviously every XC90 is going to be different, but with this, I don't think anyone's actually sat back here because the leather is in brand new condition. And like, even practicality in the third row is quite good. You've got like a little cubby hole here, you've got cubby holes under the armrests here, you've got two cup holders. Also, there are air vents up here, but when we went reading through some of the owners groups, some owners have found that their kids that sit in the third row like to put bits of Lego and even bits of food down there, and the food starts to decompose and wafts decomposing food smell through the cabin. Aren't children delightful? Now, some good news in the boot for a seven-seat SUV. Normally, these things suck when it comes to cargo space if the third row is up, but in this, it's not too bad. It's kind of about the same amount of space as a really small hatchback. But with the third row down, heaps of space. This thing is huge. And then with the second and third rows down, like you could take this thing camping. There's so much space. It's like a little van. Now, as far as tech and features and just stuff that you get to play with, generally speaking, Volvo offers, let's say, more bang for your buck than some of its other European rivals. For example, even in the very early base models of these, you can expect stuff like Bluetooth, four zone climate control, a center console touchscreen, leather seats, front and rear parking sensors, a power operated tailgate with foot opening sensors that honestly hardly ever work. And hit pause now just to see just an overview of what else. 
But go for a more recent and higher spec example, and my god, you get some stuff. We're talking adaptive air suspension, USB-C charging ports, wireless phone charging, plus Volvo's latest infotainment software and system is Google designed, so it comes with inbuilt Google Maps and Google Assistant, plus Apple CarPlay is also included. Also, find an XC90 fitted with this Bowers and Wilkins sound system, because my god, to give you an idea, my other job, my job for like 30 years has been as a touring session drummer, percussionist and DJ and producer and stuff. The sound system in this, honestly, is like recording level quality. It sounds phenomenal. Maybe the best sounding car stereo I've ever heard. Although, in using it, and more specifically the infotainment system in general, plenty of owners have complained about just the, the usability of this. It's just not intuitive at all. Even with me today, I just can't seem to get my Bluetooth to connect at all. It's been a bit of a nightmare. Now look guys, obviously we can't go deep into every single detail of all the features and equipment, all that sort of stuff. It would take forever. Plus they all vary quite dramatically depending on what year model and trim spec you're looking at. But for all of that information and so much more, jump on Redriven.com and check out our awesome and completely free Redriven cheat sheet. It covers everything you're gonna need to know. Now look, as far as safety goes, like Volvo, alongside with Mercedes-Benz, kind of invented car safety. So being the big family people mover sort of thing, this thing is dripping in safety gear. But to take you through exactly what safety features you can expect, we're gonna to cut to another voiceover, but with these things being so popular amongst you know cool, sophisticated families and being made in Sweden, it seems that we should play some traditional Swedish music. Basically, as was so eloquently communicated, the XC90 seems hell-bent on keeping you alive. Okay, so what is this thing like to drive? Well, do you want the good news or the bad news first? Bad news? Yeah, I thought so. First of all, the brake calibration's bloody weird. Like, I can't seem to get used to how much pressure to put through the brake pedal. Sometimes it slows down really nicely, other times it kind of like jerks and gets a bit weird. Yeah, it's almost like they got to like 90% of the development time of the brakes and they went, yeah, that'll do. Next up, like you can almost feel it's working and trying really hard at trying to hide its sheer size and weight, but it sort of ends up being like someone doing a really bad cover version of a song. Like it does feel smaller than what it is, but at the same time, you, yeah, you constantly have this sense that it's like, oh, I'm trying to hide the weight, I'm trying to hide the weight, I'm trying to hide the weight, but I can't quite. Also, with this one having a turbo and a supercharger and an electric motor, again, it feels like the calibration, they got to like 90% of getting the job done and then went, yeah, that'll do. Like it just feels not as fluid between transitioning between like the gearbox and all of the different drive systems. It's not bad, it's just a little bit, just a little bit underdone. And then there's a huge blind spot over there. I know the car's covered in sensors and cameras and all sorts of stuff, but yeah, that blind spot is massive. And that means that sometimes reverse parking in tight situations can be just a little bit terrifying. Also, the suspension. It's like when you hit a bump, there's this initial kind of hit and then it kind of sorts itself out. Rather than doing that all as kind of one thing, the suspension isn't bad. Ride quality is not bad at all, but it's certainly not at like Hyundai or Kia levels of good. Granted, Hyundai and Kia generally tune their car suspension for Australian conditions. This one hasn't, and you can tell. It's just, again, it feels like they got to 90% of the job and went, yeah, that'll do. In saying that, the fact that it's wearing 22 inch rims with low profile tires probably doesn't do anything to help its cause. But then all of the positives. Look, I know those negatives seem probably a little bit harsh and being honest here, unless you get to drive premium SUVs back to back every day of the week, chances are if you just drive one of these, this is gonna feel phenomenally good. It's only until you go back to back against like an Audi or a Merc or a BMW or a Lexus or anything that you suddenly start to feel there's a few compromises with this. For normal people, you'll never know. So what I'm trying to say is that for the vast majority of the population, this still provides all of the lovely premium SUV feels and driving experience that you would ever hope for. Then there are the lack of rattles and squeaks in here. There are complaints online that these interiors can get really rattly in this particular one, and we've gone looking for potholes, 
there are no rattles, there are no squeaks, it's silent. Now this next one, it might be a positive, but it might be a negative depending on your opinion. This is the Polestar equipped XC90, which would make you feel or assume that it's like a proper performance SUV. It was never designed to be that. It's just it's supposed to be like a really spirited performer. And when you do floor that right foot, yeah, it moves. It's not like X5M fast or Porsche KN turbo fast, nothing like that. But it's a really nice balance between a normal premium SUV and a performance premium SUV. And finally, overall, what's it like to drive? Look, this is just for me, but I just kind of like the fact I don't feel as pretentious driving this as I do with certain other premium brands. This is a bit more understated, flies under the radar a little bit more. I like the overall feel of this, for me, more than some of the others. Now guys, if you get specifically one of these, which is the T8 with the Polestar pack, not only do you get the full fat 320 kilowatts and 680 newton meters, but according to Volvo, you'll still return fuel consumption figures of just 2.1 liters per 100 Ks. Plus, you also get up to 43 kilometers of full EV range. However, in saying that, to achieve those fuel economy numbers, this thing has to be completely charged. It has to be somewhere between eight and 13 degrees, like early on a Wednesday morning specifically. There can't be anyone or anything else inside the car and you need to be wearing something extremely aerodynamic. Actually achieving those consumption figures? Yeah, never gonna happen. Also, this is a European vehicle and it's obviously very, very complex under there, which means parts and labor will be asking a premium and as you're about to see, you might be requiring them. Now, a massive thank you to Khalil for lending us his XC90. You're a legend, mate. Also, XC90 owners groups, you legends. The amount of advice and guidance we were given while researching this video from the owners groups was absolutely staggering. Staggering. If you own one of these or you're looking at buying one of these, join an owners group. Also, if you've got like a cool or interesting car and you live in Sydney or Newcastle and would like us to feature it, let us know in the comments or hit us up on the socials. And now we get to the part of the video that we know you guys love, but in this case, I personally despise because I'm mildly in love with this car. What goes wrong with it? Okay, so first up, the sunroofs are known to basically completely fail, either not opening or not closing. Generally speaking, it won't close when it starts to rain, which is when you obviously need it to close its most. Also with the sunroofs, many owners have complained that these things leak, and it's not always because of blocked drainage channels. Sometimes they just leak. Unfortunately, the water finds its way into this center console kind of where the controls are, where the lighting is, and kind of fries that, and then can even drip down onto the dashboard, creating even more problems. Now to fix this often requires the entire sunroof mechanism, the whole thing to be removed and replaced and fixed. That can take hours, and if it needs spare parts, that's gonna cost a lot of money, potentially thousands of dollars just to fix a small water leak. Now just on the electronics, basically anything on the exterior that has electricity running to it, also has reports of problems running to it. We're talking about lights, parking sensors, windows, door locks, mirrors, all of them can have faults. Then there are reports that the windscreen, or basically all of the glass, the roof rails, and even the sunroof are inadequately sealed, which means water can get in and eventually drains down into your footwells and the footwells can get soggy and gross. Also, misaligned body panels and even poorly fitted doors, that's another area that water can get in. Actually, just on the doors, check for any water dripping from the bottom of the doors. It's never a good sign. Now guys, we simply don't have time to go into the deep, dark secrets of the suspension, but many XC90s with the air suspension, that air suspension system can be a nightmare. It can be faulty or completely fail. Now guys, because these are so often used as a family car and because children can be just complete shit, check the entire exterior for any signs of dings and scratches and bad repair work. Actually, just on that, there's a whole bunch of other things you do need to check when buying really any used car. Go and watch our Ultimate Used Car Buyer's Guide to make that entire process really easy and enjoyable. Next up, the sensors for the uh, automatic tailgate. The sensors are shit. They only work if your shoes are made of like steel or iron or are just magnetic in some way. But for normal people, normal feet, hey, <laughs> that took like 15 minutes. Okay, inside, what goes wrong? Hang on, just, uh, I just wanna let you know, I hate this part of the video. I love this car and this part is really, really hurting me. Inside, what goes wrong? Again, check for water. Check for dampness in the carpets and any signs that there's been water inside the car. And by that I mean like check under the carpets because that's where a lot of the wiring loom and even some parts of the ECU and control units actually are. So yeah, wiring and electronics sitting with water, they're not BFFs. Uh, like, unless of course BFF stands for blown fuses frequently. But like guys, in all seriousness, 
seriousness, press every button, make sure everything works. That's going to take some time because there are buttons all over the place, but if you're buying one of these, make sure the seats work, make sure all the functionality actually works because quite often it doesn't. Now the infotainment systems, as I mentioned earlier, these things can have some dramas. We're talking screens going completely black or just flickering and freaking out, cameras not connecting, just the functionality being an absolute nightmare. Some owners have reported that a software update fixes all this, but then other owners have also complained that even with software updates, they still just play up all the time. But like the most troubling issue with these electrical gremlins is that there are owners that have reported hearing like a, a clunking noise and then the power just goes out. Screens go blank, display goes blank, windows don't go up and down, but the car keeps running. That's terrifying. But in saying that, it can even get worse. We have also read reports where the car, the engine just completely stalls and then therefore the steering locks, but the car's still moving forward. No. Just no. But look, while we're destroying all of your hopes and dreams, mechanically, what goes wrong with the XC90? I can't tell you because I'm not a qualified mechanic. Definitely not qualified to fix something as complex as this. But you know who is? It's Jim. So in terms of reliability, is Geely a better custodian of the brand than Ford was? Maybe. And are they as reliable as the Volvos from the good old days? Well, actually, no. They're not. The earlier versions of this generation, well, they had a lot more problems because they did iron out a lot of the issues as the models went on, but even the later ones do have plenty of problems. One of the common problems is the PCV system or the oil trap as Volvo likes to call it. Uh, it has a bunch of diaphragms and springs and valves in there and they often fail and when they do that can cause uh, vacuum leaks within the engine. It can also make oil leaks worse and that can also contribute to the oil, con oil consumption issues of which there are plenty. It is fairly common to see supercharger complications. That's on the twin charge version. Um, it's not uncommon for them to have seal issues from as low as 50 or 60,000 kilometers. You'll know that you cannot quite often hear the noise and they run terribly and they log a, a lean air fuel ratio fault code. Uh, and just on those fault codes, it is pretty common on these things to log phantom fault codes. They are very complicated, so the fault codes can't always be trusted. So it's something you really have to diagnose properly. The cooling systems on these, they're okay, although they are prone to leaks. The electronic water pump is a weak point, and they also have a coolant bypass hose. It's a plastic hose on the top of the engine. It often splits and when it does, causes an overheating event. And that coolant pipe is actually part of a recall program. So definitely get that checked. Exhaust manifold leaks are pretty common. Sometimes the manifolds actually crack and sometimes it's just the gasket. Now you'll hear that, it just makes a horrible sound and if you can't hear it, well, you'll definitely smell it. One of the biggest and worst issues that we've come across is they actually crack the cylinder liners. Now when that happens, the bottom end of the engine is just not repairable. Volvo do supply a replacement short engine for these things. Uh, it's about a 20 to 25 hour round trip to repair it. So if it's not done under warranty, which in some cases it is, it is uh, if it's not done under warranty, it's just ridiculously expensive. Overall, the diesels aren't too bad. They do have a common problem where the EGR pipe cracks. And again, you can hear that. Um, they do have occasionally some problems with the DPRs and turbos and injectors, but overall really no worse than any other diesel in this segment. And the diesels, just like the petrols, are prone to oil consumption too. There's plenty of documented cases about the hybrid control systems failing, poorly performing batteries, and ERAD failures. That's the electronic rear axle drive assembly. Sometimes that just completely stops. Now, some of those ERAD issues were sorted with recalls and some were fixed under warranty. And in some cases, they were given an extended warranty. In some cases, they've, they've been replaced two and three times. Now, big shout out to our local Newcastle Volvo dealership. The car we tested has had it replaced and he's also been given a lifetime warranty on that car. So if you're having issues, pressure your Volvo dealer and just see if you can get that covered. There's plenty of reports on these things about a chronic vibration in the driveline. It usually starts with, well, let's get the wheels and tires balanced. And then it usually goes, well, let's get the disc brake rotors machined or replaced. And then quite often it ends up being a problem with the drive shafts. And quite often all four drive shafts can be replaced. And even after that, some people are still complaining about low speed and acceleration vibrations. And it seems to be quite difficult to fix. Lower control arm bushes do wear out fairly prematurely and the air ride system, there are plenty of issues there with the suspension itself and the compressor that runs the whole thing. A couple of service recommendations. The diesel's timing belts are due at 150 and the petrol engines are due at 240. Now that's okay, but if you have any signs of oil leak at the front of the engine, uh, it's highly recommended you get that done much sooner.
the transmissions in these, Volvo will say, well, they're filled for life and you don't have to do anything. Well, we all know that's bullshit. Uh, just service a transmission every 80,000 kilometers. And if you're towing something, do it every 50. And this is one of those cars where there are heaps of recalls. Have a look at the redriven cheat sheets. They're all on there. And you can also do a bunch of other independent VIN searches, but you really should just make sure all the recalls are up to date. Now, typically the owners of these really love them despite any of the problems they've had or will admit to. Um, and some people have had no problems whatsoever, but it's fairly likely that if you're looking to buy one and you're talking to an owner, they will most likely recommend getting some sort of extended warranty just to be on the safe side. Okay, so after all of that, should you buy one? Okay, look, personally, yeah, I still would, but you probably shouldn't. See, I love cars, and I especially love cars like the XC90. I love how it looks, I love the practicality and the whole vibe of this big Volvo. I love how it drives. I also love the tech involved in the engine and the hybrid system. But my day job is making car videos, so I'm in the incredibly fortunate position that access to multiple cars is never really a drama. Plus, my best mate is a mechanic, so access to parts and labor are probably easier for me than most. So look, if you're in the same position as me and you also have the financial means to maintain and let's be honest, most likely repair the XC90, or the XC90 that you're looking at still has plenty of years of full factory warranty left on it, yeah, sure, buy it. There will still be times that you absolutely hate it, but some of the best relationships are the love-hate ones, aren't they? But if the XC90 that you're looking at has run out of its full factory warranty, and you don't have a second car, and you're not in the position to access, say, a spare five to $10,000 easily, God no, do not buy one of these. See, for many, just like me actually, this is a dream car, but the wrong XC90, especially with no factory warranty left on it, can become a complete nightmare. Which then brings us to a question for you guys. Would you still buy one of these or would you get like an Audi Q7 instead? Or do you go super sensible and buy like a Toyota Kluger or Highlander? Let us know in the comments. See you next time. So the big question is, should you ever seriously considering buying one of these? Considering buying one of these? Chances are you're gonna have to pay for it unless you... There are a lot of issues with the swi switches and sensors and a lot of, I'm gonna do the whole bit again. The whole switch and sensor system in the ECU often has very, uh, but why, why, why? Guys, if you go for exactly one of these, which is a T8 with the Polestar pack, not only will you, 